Beginning with verse 10, we'll read through verse 16. We'll read these verses responsibly. The 16th verse is the text verse for this morning's message. Psalm 81, verses 10 through 16. Let's stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies, and turned my hand against their adversaries. Haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. And then together on the text verse. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. And let's pray. And Father, thank you for giving us this wonderful day, made wonderful, not just because of a bit of sunshine, but made Wonderful because we're privileged together as a family. Thank you for this, our church. Thank you for our preacher, for giving us a man of God who uh, reminds us so much of thee. We are reminded of your love and your compassion for us through our preacher. And we believe that you've given him something for us today that's awfully important. So help us to listen and to gain from this service that which you had in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody said, somebody said, uh, where's that fellow sit in church? I said, anywhere he wants to sit. I'm going to read just a few of the verses without your turning to it read a while ago and as I read the verses I'm going to have a comment or two before I pray and bring the message God is speaking he says I am the Lord thy God who has brought thee out of the land of Egypt open thy mouth wide and I will fill it but my people would not hearken to my voice what God said is I told you open your mouth wide I'll fill it my folks didn't open their mouths wide they wouldn't listen to what I said and Israel Please take the baby out, whoever has the baby. Somebody help the, help take the baby out quickly, if you would, please. Real quick, like, I want to get, get right into the message, and we have nurseries for the babies. I hope somebody's helped me back there. All right, I'll start again. Verse 10. It said, I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. He said, I, I, I told you that open your mouth wide, I'd fill it, but you didn't. And he said, you have none of me. Look, I, I don't, don't, don't necessarily turn to it, but I want to read this. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. He said, I wish they had. I had so much to give them. They just opened the mouth wide. I, I would have filled it, but they wouldn't listen to me. He said, I wish they had. Of. And then it says this. He should have fed them also with the finest of wheat. In other words, I had the finest of wheat to give you, but you wouldn't open your mouth. And here's my text. And with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. He said, I had honey in every rock. And that would have satisfied you. I want to speak this morning on how to keep from getting bitter. How to keep from getting bitter. I could call it honey from the rock. But my message this morning is how to keep from getting bitter. Our Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today. A lot of people in this room having to fight bitterness this morning. A lot of people don't understand why life has treated them as it has. A lot of people this morning need to be encouraged to still have faith in a God who loves them. So I pray this morning you'd speak to my heart and through me to the hearts of these whom thou hast given me to shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen. How to keep from getting bitter. The truth is, if I were to read the heart of every person in this room this morning, if I could read your mind, 
there is bitterness all over this crown. I do not know who you are, and in a few cases I know some folks are fighting bitterness. But there is a way that God has provided to keep you and me from getting bitter. It's very simple. God is telling his people who got bitter this. If you had only known, now hear me carefully now, if you'd only known that the rock that made you bitter had honey on the inside of it. If you'd only known that the stones that you had to, and, and, the, and, the, and the rock that you had to, to, to uh, circumvent or, or uh, overcome, if you'd only known that that same rock that made you bitter had honey on the inside of it. You see, the rock is the container in which God's honey is delivered. The burden, the heartache, the problem, the trial, the sorrow, the bereavement, all of those are simply rocks that are containers in which God delivers his honey. So your life will be bitter or sweet, determined whether you look at the rock or for the honey. That's it, at the rock or for the honey. When you come to a rock in your life, a hard place in your life, somebody said the other day, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Good, you got honey on both sides of you. Uh, when you come to a rock in your life, which do you do? Do you look at the rock or do you look for the honey? Everybody here has rocks. Everybody here has hard places. Everybody has difficulties and burdens and trials and hardships. Some people here look at the rock and complain. Others look for the honey and rejoice. So your life will be bitter or sweet. And by the way, it's up to you. Everybody in this room this morning has rocks that you must hurdle. But everybody in this room this morning has inside the rock that's before you and the burden that's before you. Everybody in this room has honey in that rock. So it's strictly up to you. You decide whether or not you get bitter. And by the way, most of us, most of us could have some reasons to get bitter. I mean, I mean, if I if I looked at my life, uh, I could I could figure out some reason I'm sure why I could be bitter. Why did you do this to me? But the truth is, I've discovered in 63 years and a half of life, I've discovered there's honey in every rock that I have to face. Now I'm going to look for the honey, not at the rock. Now if you want to look at the rock, go ahead, but you'll get bitter. You look for the honey, and the honey, the sweetest thing that man knows is honey. And the honest truth is, there's honey in every single rock. I was thinking this morning, I was watching this on the platform, and uh, thinking about them. Dr. Evans over here, you don't know this because Doc is not a complainer, but Doc's a sick man. He has AIDS. <laughs> By the way, Doc, these tapes go around the world. But, uh, but uh, no, Doc's a sick man. I mean, I, mean, I mean that. He has a disease. It won't kill him, but it'll make him wish he was dead. Uh, he, he has a disease that sometimes just gets him where he can hardly move. But, but oh, he keeps on going. Why? Because Doc's not looking at the rock. He's looking for the honey. And there's honey in that rock. You come, I was thinking about on the other end over here, Dr. Claire. He had a heartbreak this summer. Uh, most men couldn't have taken what he took this summer. I mean, most men could not. And the truth is, uh, he just keeps on going. Why? Because he didn't let the rock throw him. He's not looking at the rock. He's looking for the honey in the rock. And, uh, and, 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 and I, I could go on. And on. I'm trying to think other men over here's got some burdens. Roy Moffat's got burdens. I don't know what they are, but with a face like that, he's got to have a burden somewhere. And uh, and, and I mean, these guys, have, uh, Bob Hooker over here, uh, he's not been well. Uh, he, he, he kissed Dr. Evans, and uh, and uh, he, he, he's, he's, not, he's not been well either. <laughs> but... But, but I mean, the, look, the very fact, the very fact that we can laugh this morning, there's honey in the rock. I mean, this old church has rolled over a heap of rocks in the last 12 months. But we found honey in the rock. And there's a fellowship here you won't find in a church in the world. You know why? We didn't look at the rock, we looked for the honey. Now it's up to you, you decide. If you want to look at the rock, go ahead. Gripe, complain, get bitter, go ahead. But inside that rock is some honey. And if you quit looking at the rock and look for the honey, you won't get bitter, you'll get sweet. Have you ever noticed 
how people go one way or the other as they get older? You find the poor people as they get older, they even either get harder and meaner or they get sweeter and kinder. You know why? Because, I don't care who you are, the, the longer you travel on the road, the more rocks you're going to have to have to, have to, have to face. I mean, uh, life is a rocky road. And the more rocks you're going to have to face, uh, the longer you live. But, but some people, as they get older, they get bitter. And, uh, and uh, I'll never forget that old man. I'll never forget it. When Dave, our, our boy, was born, I was in, in, the, in the Baylor Hospital in Dallas looking at, at Dave and all his little babies there. And this old man had a growl on his face. He looked at those babies and he said, Hey, you fellas, if you knew what I know, you'd want to go back where you came from. Why? He was bitter. He was bitter. Now, uh, when old, uh, people are that way, on the other hand, there are people in this room this morning that are uh, up in years. I'm not talking about 63. I doubt if anybody's older than that. But, but people that are 65 and 70 and 75 and 80 and 85 and 90 years old who are, who are just as sweet as can be. You know why? Because they're, and it's not because they haven't had any burdens. Somebody said, you know, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, she's so sweet. She's never had any problems in life, and she's so sweet. But I did not tell them what I know about Mrs. So-and-so. I mean, burden after burden, and heartache after heartache, and rock after rock. But Mrs. So-and-so has looked for the honey and not at the rock. That's up to you. If you want to look at the rock, go ahead. You'll get discouraged. If you want to look at the rock, go ahead. You'll complain. If you want to look at the rock, go ahead. You'll get bitter. But I want to tell you something. Your rock is no bigger than mine. And mine is no bigger than yours. There's no testing taken, but this is common to man. I mean, all of us have reason. We can, we can get bitter by looking at the rock and say, uh, things aren't going well for me, and I'm not having it right, and, and uh, this has happened, and here's illness, and here's a heartache, and here's a heartbreak, and God hasn't been good to me. Or you can say inside this rock here, there's some honey, and I'm going to find the honey. And I'll guarantee you, you don't have to get bitter. So, the more rocks, the more opportunity for honey. And the more burdens, the more opportunity for honey. Also, the more opportunity for bitter bitterness. Now, the sad part, as I said, we complain about the rock instead of looking for the honey. Here are two people. I'm thinking right now of two ladies in a church I used to pastor. The same day those ladies lost a baby. I don't mean miscarriage. I mean, uh, I mean a child died. And I went to see both of them the same day, years ago. One of those ladies looked at me and she said, Brother Hiles, I hate God. I hate God. And I said, why? She said, what do you mean why? He took my baby. God took my baby. A loving, just God wouldn't have taken my baby. I hate God. And bitterness gripped her soul. Why? She was looking at the rock. I went across town, Marshall, Texas. Walked to another home. Baby had died that very day. Then he walked up and smiled at me and she said, Brother Howes, isn't God good? And I said, Yes, he is. She said, Aren't we glad there's a heaven? And my baby is with Jesus right now. And my baby will never have to suffer the pains of life and the toils of life and the heartaches of life. She said, Isn't God good? You know what? Huh, she'd gotten the honey out of the rock. One lady looking at the rock, one lady looking for the honey in the rock. And, and you do what you want to do. It's up to you. Go ahead and be a griper. But you don't have to gripe. There's honey in that rock. Honey in that burden. I'm thinking of two wives. In fact, I can think of many like this. But here are two wives in college. Are their husbands in college? They may live in the same apartment, the building. Their husbands may work at the same place. Their husbands go to the same school. They have the same burdens and the same battles to fight. And one little wife says, I am a wife of a man of God. God has laid his hand on my husband. And I'm getting to iron the shirts of a man of God. And I'm going to be the wife of a man of God. I'm going to be a wife of one who stands between the living and the dead. A man who stands for God and is called on whose, whom God has placed his hand. And the other wife complains and says, I'm tired of this apartment. I'm tired of this life. And I'm going back home. You know, there's nothing in the world that disgusts me anymore than for some little female who lives in America, who has the freedom of America, whose name is written in heaven, whose sins are forgiven, on your way to glory. Jesus is your Savior. God is your Father. Heaven is your home. The Bible is your book, complaining because your husband happened to be called by God Almighty and you're having it rough. 
Little college wife, you don't have to be a Jezebel if you don't choose to be. But, ma'am, I'll do the preaching here and you'll be quiet while I'm preaching. Now you listen to me carefully. There's honey in the rock. If all you want to do is look at the rock, go ahead and talk about your problems and your heartaches and, and uh, we don't have this and don't have that. Well, you have Jesus, don't you? You have heaven, don't you? You have the Holy Spirit, don't you? You have the Bible, don't you? And bless God, God has called you and led you in God's name. Quit looking at that rock and griping and look at the sweetness in, the, in that rock, the honey that's on the inside of the rock. Or two people have a heartbreak. One blames God. The other praises God. Isn't that strange? I mean, here, here's poor old God. Well, God isn't old, but poor, poor young God. No, God isn't young. Poor middle-aged God. Poor 63-year-old God. Poor, poor God. I mean, he's getting praises from one side and gripes from the other side about the same things. I mean, here's, here's a person that has a heartache. And, and he, he finds out, as Paul said, I rejoice in my tribulation. I rejoice in my persecution. I, I, uh, it brings me closer to God. It makes me trust God more. On the other hand, same person, same, uh, same type person, same problem, same, same trouble, same heartache, gets bitter and ugly and not friendly and not kind and gripes all the time and complains all the time. Let me tell you something. You don't have to complain because the rock, there's honey on the inside of that rock. Look in there. Here are two people, two couples having a tough time in college. One, I, I, I was talking the other day, a couple out east, I was preaching. They said, Brother Hiles, we, we left college. I said, I had an idea, you did, when I saw you here. I said, why? They said, we had it tough. Well, you're supposed to have it tough. You need to have it tough. This is not a, a picnic, this is a, a war we're in. And that campus is not a campus, it's, a, it's an army camp for Jesus. And those dormitories are not dormitories, they're barracks. And those students are not students, they're soldiers. And you've got to have it tough. Well, here's a couple that says we can't take it anymore. Oh, yes, you can take it. There's no testing taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tested or tempted above that you're able. And with the temptation, also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. You can take it. And if you, if you will take it, if you just stop, I'll guarantee you. Those little couples that stay here and take it and sacrifice, and those little wives that do without, I guarantee you, the day is going to come. Ma'am, I won't ask you to leave now if you don't quit talking while I'm preaching. The day is going to come when you're going to look back on these college days and you will say they're the sweetest days of our lives. Look at Donald Trump. Brother, if I were a young, young, a young couple, I couldn't be a young couple, I'm getting close to it, but <laughs> look at me now, look at me. If I were a young man with a young wife in Howes Anderson College, I had rather have the peace of God and be in the will of God than have all Mr. Trump's millions and billions of dollars. Here are two pastors face the same crisis. Same crisis. One pastor quits. You know what the difference in greatness in the ministry is and, and, and failure? The preacher who, who becomes great in the ministry is the one who stays when he faces the same problem that the other fella quit over. Lee Robertson was at Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga for 40 years. I guarantee you, every preacher in America that's ever quit a church because of problems, I guarantee you sometime in those 40 years, Lee Robertson faced that same problem. Dr. Tom Malone was pastor in Emmanuel Baptist Church, Pontiac, Michigan, over 40 years. I guarantee you, every, every preacher in America who's quit or turned back because he got uh, the burdens were too heavy, the load was too heavy to bear, well, preacher, in God's name, what you're supposed to do is preach to people who have burdens and convince them that he's able. That's the job. That's the job. 
guarantee you Dr. Tom Malone has faced every burden any preacher faced that made him quit. The other day, the other night rather, I got a phone call. I returned the call. The pastor said to me, Brother Hiles, I don't know how I can face next Sunday. And I said, why? And he told me a sad, sad, tragic story. But he said, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on going. Last Monday morning, I came to my office. I was told uh, last uh, Monday, or maybe Sunday, I was told a sad story. A preacher friend of mine, a man I loved, had the same problem that this man had, as just mentioned. But wait a minute. I love this fellow. I've kept him going in some ways. I've sent him money. I've encouraged his heart. I've written him letters, called him on the telephone. Ma'am, you'll have to, ma'am, you'll have to stay, stay back there now. You can't just walk in and out like this. Just sit down now and stay there. And if you don't now, I'm going to ask you, I'm gonna have to have somebody take you outside. I don't mean to be unkind to you, but if everybody did what you're doing right now, we couldn't have a service this morning. Now listen carefully to me. Don't get upset. I'm, I'm going to say it to you if you do the same thing. Don't get upset now. I'm trying to help you, and I can't help you with folks uh, uh, walking around and having a guided tour of the crowd this morning. Now listen to me. Last week, one morning last week, I came to the office. I got the news that my friend, and I mean my friend, he and I were rather close. Pastor, that killed himself. Now I want to tell you, what's the difference between that man and the other pastor with whom I talked had the same problem, who said and is, he keeps on going. What's the difference? One's watching the rock. One's watching the honey in the rock. Now you listen to me. Everybody, you, you're no different than anybody else. You, you don't have more problems than anybody else has. Probably you don't have any less than anybody else has. And you deserve some sympathy, but you don't have a right to quit. You don't have a right to turn back. But God looked down and God said, I had so many things I want to do for you. I told you, Israel, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. Uh, uh, one of you fellas, that there, take her back in the hallway and have her sit in the hallway there. I don't mean to be unkind to her, and I'm sure she has a problem that most ladies have. That's preaching, ain't it? Boy, I'm going to preach the Bible whether you like it or not. And by the way, believe it or not, I'm going to get through this sermon too. If I can keep you ladies still long enough, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this sermon. Either that or I'll just quit. <laughs> now, what's the difference? There's honey in the rock. God said, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, get, to fill your mouth. I had many things to give you. I had, I had good wheat to give you. <laughs> but you wouldn't open your mouth wide. I had blessings for you. But you got, where well, you complained and you got bitter. And you, you looked at the rocks and, and you looked at the obstacles in the wilderness and I brought you out of Egypt and I gave you manna from heaven and I gave you uh, water from the rock uh, when Moses smote it with his rod and I gave you uh, protection, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and I had so many things I wanted to give you but you wouldn't take it and the reason you wouldn't take it you got to griping, you got to complaining because of all the rough places in life and the rocks in the path but God said if you'd look carefully enough you'd have found honey in every single rock that you had. When Jacob had placed her little baby in the Nile River it was a hard place in her life but look carefully, Jacobin. There's honey in that rock. That little baby is going to one day become second in command of all Egypt and, would, and could become, if, if, if he chose, he could become the next Pharaoh. But that little, young, that little baby, something else is going to happen to him. God's going to watch over him. And one of these days, he, that little baby there that you placed in the Nile River, he's going to deliver the entire Israel, race of, of Israel from the, from the yoke of Egyptian bondage. There's honey in that rock, Jacobin. When Paul was stoned in Lystra, outside the city, I mean the rocks were hitting his head, and Paul even was killed for a while and came back. And uh, But Paul, there's honey in that rock. There's a young lad named Timothy watching you. He's seeing you die. He sees your strength. He sees your grace. He's going to be your comforter and your companion on many a missionary journey. Paul, don't bristle about this. There's honey inside that rock. 
when Stephen was stoned outside the city of Jerusalem, outside of what is now called the Stephen's Gate. When Stephen was stoned, uh, he was there and he died. But Stephen, uh, wait a minute, Stephen, don't complain about that. There's honey in that rock because Stephen looked up and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. There was honey in the rock. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the fiery furnace and the thermostat was raised seven times hotter and they were in the fiery furnace, uh, the rock was before them. But hey, fellas, don't be worried about that rock. Look for some honey. If you'll get in, when you get inside that furnace, there's going to be a fourth one inside the furnace, even Jesus Christ himself. Yes, there's a rock, but there's honey in that rock. When Daniel was cast in the lion's den, it was a big rock and a big hurdle. But Daniel, look carefully. You're going to be delivered. And the lions will not hurt you. And God will give lockjaw to every one of those lions and paralyze their, their paws and their claws. And there's honey in that rock. When a committee from Tarrant County Baptist Association came to see a young preacher named John R. Rice and said to Dr. John R. Rice, he was not Dr. Rice then, said, young man, if you keep on attacking, Baylor University because of the evolution that's being taught on the campus of Baylor University. And by the way, did you hear this this week about Baylor? Baylor University, this week, they're, 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 they're meeting and, and deciding this week on whether or not to allow dancing on the campus of Baylor University. Every Southern Baptist in Texas who gives a dime tithe to a Southern Baptist church has a portion of that money that goes to Baylor University. And if, if, and, and if they do, do have dancing, you'll be supporting the dancing. If they don't have dancing, you'll be supporting a school that contemplated having dancing. Now I'm simply saying, Dr. Rice said, there's evolution being taught in the classroom at Baylor University. And the Tarrant County Baptist Association said, we'll put you out of our association. We'll kick you out. Uh, and Dr. Rice faced the rock. Hey, young preacher, there's honey in that rock. And from that rock, there came the mighty, the 20th century's mightiest pen and the great John R. Rice, God's gift to independent Baptist people. When the Hamilton County Association came to Dr. Lee Robertson and censored him, because of his stand for the truth. And Dr. Robertson was forced to, be, uh, uh, to, to leave the Hamilton County Baptist Association in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That was a mighty rock. Hey, young Dr. Robertson. Hey, young man. Hey, young preacher. Look carefully. Inside that rock, you'll find some honey. And haven't we all tasted the sweetness of the great ministry of Dr. Lee Robertson? Well, you say that's right. There was honey in that rock. Well, there's honey in your rock, too. The London, London Baptist Association had a meeting one day to consider the expulsion of a young preacher. They voted this young preacher out. Oh, only seven delegates voted for him. And the entire association voted out Charles Haddon Spurgeon. How would you like to be the moderator of that association right now? Seven votes. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon faced that rock. Young Charles, young Spurgeon, there's a rock before you. It's an awful rock. I know myself. I've, I've been through the same thing. But I want to tell you something, Mr. Spurgeon. Look carefully. There's honey inside that rock. And thanks be to God, all those sermons that Spurgeon has in print that have blessed people all across the world through all these years and all the great ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon came from that rock in his life of being voted out of the London Baptist Association. When the ordaining council voted not to ordain young Dwight Moody, how would you like to have been on that ordaining council? They voted not to ordain young Dwight Moody because they said he did not know enough to pass the ordination. And Dwight L. Moody was never ordained in all of his life because he couldn't pass the ordaining council. Mr. Moody... That must have been a great shock to you, that Congregationalist Church. You should have been a Baptist anyway. That way you could have gotten ordained and voted out by some association somewhere. But it's a big rock. But from that rock, there was honey that brought America back to God. And that one man lifted two continents toward God and on his own shoulders brought uh, two continents closer to God. Why? Because he faced a rock. No rock, no honey. No battle, no honey. No sorrow, no honey. No heartache, no honey. No bereavement, no honey. If you want to have the honey, you've got to have the rocks. That's the way God transports the honey from heaven to earth. 
the Dallas Baptist Association voted Joe Boyd out because he wouldn't support Baylor University and other of the liberal schools. It was a pretty tough thing for Joe Boyd. But Joe, in that rock, there's honey. And God gave to independent Baptists one of the most faithful evangelists that our country has known. When God, on that same day, October 10, 1956, I think it was, when Joe Boyd was voted out of the Dallas Association, I was given my choice. You support our program or we'll vote you out. I said, I'll not give one dime to any institution that doesn't believe this book. I'll not give one dime to an institution that has liquor on its campus. I'll not give one dime to a so-called Christian college that has little half-naked uh, majorettes strutting up down at halftime, showing their thighs and their underwear to seven, several thousand people. I'll not do it. And all of a sudden, I was voted out because of, I took my stand. And I went home, and we faced a rock. But bless God, from that rock has flowed honey now all these many long years. John was exiled to Patmos. He faced a rock, but there was honey in that rock. And from that rock there came forth the book of Revelation. And Paul was imprisoned in Rome. He faced the rock of imprisonment, but there was honey in that rock. From that came the book of 1 Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, the book of uh, Titus. And from the honey of the rock that Paul faced, uh, the, the, the rock there came forth honey that was, sweetens our lives daily from the word of God when John Bunyan was placed in the Bedford jail for a dozen years in the rock there in the jail from that jail and that rock there came the honey we call Pilgrim's Progress I've had a heap of rocks in my path in these 42 years but I've always found honey in every rock I'm not going to get bitter I'm not going to do it I'm not going to, I'm not going to become, if God will give me strength and sanity, I'm not going to become a bitter old man. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to shout because of God's love as an old man. I'm going to praise God for my salvation as an old man. I'm going to love this book more as an old man. I'm going to love him more as an old man. Why? Because in every rock I've ever faced, honey came out. I'm not going to look at the rock. I'm going to look for the honey. Now, why don't you do that? Past year, I've had a few rocks in my room. May I tell you a little bit of the honey in those rocks? The greatest people who ever lived stood with me. The most love I've ever received from a church, this or any other, in my 42 years of pastoring has come my way in the last year. Brother, give me the rocks. I want the honey on the inside. What else has come? I have more real friends across this nation today than any other single preacher. I don't mean preacher to pop political friends. I mean real friends who would live and die for me than any preacher alive. What else has come? The presses are rolling right now. The presses are rolling right now on my sermon books that'll go around this world after I'm gone to heaven even and my sermons have been read all over the world even while I'm shouting on the streets of glory that honey would never have come had there been no rock don't run from the rock thank God for the rock that's the I mean every time every time a rock comes up uh, open it up it's like a hard walnut there's a mighty good eating on the inside of that thing and then May I say this without sounding pious. Jesus has been closer to me in the last 12 months than he's ever been in my life. There's honey in the rock. Sure, the rock is not easy. None of us likes to come to this, this, the pathway that's strewn by rocks and burdens and heartaches. No, it's not enjoyable. Our daughter's illness. The honey hadn't come out yet. But it's in there. It's in there. <laughs> and I'm not going to gripe because of the rock. 
I'm going to praise God because our God never sends a rock with that honey inside of it. Let me testify. There's honey in every rock. How about you today? Are you facing the rock of bereavement? You've lost the dearest of life. You have two choices. You can get bitter at God or look for the honey. Are you this morning facing the rock of heartbreak? Has some circumstance in life broken you? You find it hard in the morning to get up and face the world? Wake up in the morning and wish it were a dream and hope it maybe it was and say, I think it was a dream and all of a sudden you find it wasn't a dream. It's still there. You have one or two choices. You look at the rock or you look for the honey. Has a child disappointed you? Did your daughter get pregnant before she was married? Is your son with the dope gang today? You said, Brother Howells, I've done the best I can. I don't understand it. I've given, I've tithed, and I've been to church, and, and I've been faithful to church, and I've tried to do everything you said to do, and I've tried to rear my children according to the Bible. I've done all I can. I don't know what else to do. Why did God do this to me? God did it to you because he's got some honey he wants to send you, and inside that rock is some honey. You're facing that rock this morning of being forsaken by your husband. Are you facing the rock this morning of somebody who left you to pay the bills and do all the work and rear the family or the children by yourself? You say, oh, how in the world? I got a letter this week and I won't give you any idea who it was from. Got a letter this week from a young lady. Her husband, years ago, several years ago, just forsook her. I mean, ran off with a teenage girl. Just took, took off, left her and the children. She had no place to go, no place to live. And of course she contacted Brother Hiles and I'm glad she did. And I helped them get back home here. Now then for these years she's reared those children. This week she wrote me a letter and she said, Brother Hiles, I had two dreams years ago. I won't tell you what those dreams were, but she said, Brother Hiles, she said both of those dreams have been fulfilled in my life. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now she didn't say, well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta open, uh, get all the windows unstuck by myself. And, I, and I've got to do all the, I've got to take care of all the uh, fixing up of the house by my... No, she did not say that. She said it was a rock and it was tough. But praise God, I found some honey on the inside. That's what she said. Are you facing the rock of facing life alone? Are you, young, are you a young lady? You're as attractive as anybody have a good personality every reason in the world why young men ought to be pursuing you the truth is you're up now 30 35 getting close to 40 years of age not married yet and all of a sudden the, the 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 reality has come that you may have to live alone and you may never be called a wife and there may, may never be a mother never have a child to call you mommy and all of a sudden your dreams and life have been shattered Young lady, let me tell you something. You look up to God and say, Dear God, I'm not going to look at this rock. I'm just going to I'm going to look for the honey on the inside of this rock. And I'll guarantee you, you ask Maxine Jeffress, this is not a heap of honey on the inside of that rock. Is your rock an illness this morning? Let me praise God for a minute. I don't know why I thought about this, but just about right now. 30... One years ago, I was being wooed and courted by this church. You did not know it, most of you. A few of you are still here who were on maybe on the committee at the time. But I was being wooed and, and uh, courted by this church, and I was not interested in this church. I was happy where I was. My mother lived and my sister both lived within 20 miles of where we lived. My wife's parents lived within 20 miles of where we lived. Our home neighborhood was within 20 miles of where we lived. And I was pastor of a church in my home county. And it was the fastest growing church in the world for, for several years. We wanted to spend the life, our lives there. And all of a sudden, word came. I remember that first letter I got, I think it was last month, 31 years ago said the dear Reverend Hiles we're interested we have uh, our 
Pastor, beloved Pastor oh, Dr. Owen Miller resigned after 11 years of fruitful service. Your name has been given to us with 66 other names, wondering if you're interested in our pulpit. said, fill out the enclosed questionnaire. Good night. You ought to have seen that questionnaire. You can get married, join the army, and get a, a visa to Japan faster than you can fill out that questionnaire. I sent back and I wrote on where it said comments. I said, I don't believe in applying for churches. I said, get on your knees and have an all-night prayer meeting. And pray for God's man. I got a letter back almost to the day, 31 years ago today. I said, dear Reverend Hiles, we were interested in your application. Would you come and preach at First Baptist Church Hammond? I wrote back and said, no. They wrote back and said, would you meet the pulpit committee halfway in Springfield, Missouri? I wrote back and said, I wouldn't meet you one block north of the Garland, Texas city limits. They wrote back and they kept begging and kept begging and kept begging. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, maybe God was in this thing and I died. One of the hardest days in my life was when I took my family Sunday noon afternoon August 23rd 1959 and left Garland Texas I stopped at the city limit sign I got out and cried heart was broken I haven't faced many rocks any harder than that one But for 30 years, honey has been flowing. For 30 years, the sweetness of God and His will and His word and His work has been flowing. Let me just testify, there's honey in that rock. Don't look at it and get bitter. Don't blame God. Doc, you could say, I'm president of a college. I don't understand why I have to have this illness that will hound me the rest of my life. Sometimes Doc, all of a sudden, without any warning, gets so exhausted he can hardly move. They call that laziness in Texas, but it's exhaustion up here. <laughs> but, see, but I mean, he gets exhausted, he can hardly move. You've probably noticed him sleeping through all my sermons. He could look at it and say, look, I'm not an old man yet. I've got a lot of my life ahead of me. I'm president of a college. Why can't I be strong now that I need to be strong? Or he can say, maybe God wants to pull me aside every once in a while just to be with him. There's honey in that rock. There's honey in that rock. It's up to you. You can be bitter if you want to by looking at the rock. Or you can be sweet by looking for the honey. Our Heavenly Father. Sometimes I wish you'd just send the honey and jar.